Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Mushroom Show. Hey, if you're excited about the spring and the coming summer and all the possibilities for wild mushroom foraging, well, I really think you're gonna love this interview because we are talking to Eric Whitehead, who is the founder of a company called Untamed Feast. Now, basically what Untamed Feast does is they go out into the wild and they harvest a bunch of wild foods, specifically wild mushrooms, and then turn those into delicious food products that you can enjoy at home. Now, Eric has a ton of experience and a ton of stories to tell really all about foraging for wild mushrooms. We talk about everything from harvesting morel mushrooms to harvesting porcini mushrooms and everything in between. We talk about some of the crazy wars that used to go on between wild mushroom foragers. We talk about whether or not you should be worried about finding poisonous mushrooms in wild mushroom products. Spoiler alert, you shouldn't be. And we also talk about Eric founding the company and what it takes to actually start and run a wild foods company. So there's a ton of great information in this interview and if you're interested at all in wild mushrooms, I really think you're going to love it. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview with Eric Whitehead. Eric Whitehead, thank you so much for joining us here on The Mushroom Show. Mm, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, you are many things, but I just wanted to read the, the bio right from your website. So it says, Eric Whitehead, mushroom guy, has a lifetime of wilderness skills and a contagious curiosity for how to interact with everything in nature. He's never had a nine to five and is equally interested in winter camping as he is in the nuances of crypto and the colonization of Mars. Lucky for us, he chose the path of elevating mushrooms and wild foods over 20 years ago. So I think the first thing I wanted to ask you among all of those things is why mushrooms? What drew you to mushrooms amongst all of those things? What drew you to mushrooms and wild foods in the first place? As if I had a choice. <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't the mushrooms draw us to them? That's, you know, uh, I got this one right now. It says the mushrooms are calling and I must go. So that must be something that yeah, you heard. Yeah. Well, for the, I mean, for the sake of um, those that don't believe in that very strange, but very true joke that I just made. Um, by the way, isn't my wife a great writer? <laughs> she would have wrote that. I, I don't write like that. It's well done. So, I mean, yes. Assuming I had a choice in how it works, this is how it, how it shook down. My parents, uh, they were back to the lander types, you know, they, um, my dad decided he wanted to build a log cabin in the woods and he was driving through Asuyas and met my mom hitchhiking with her horse or something. And they fell in love and she decided to go with them on his dream of going up to the Chilcotin interior and building a cabin in the wilderness. So that's what they did. They even squatted in the woods up there, didn't have any land and lived off the land and they didn't really pick much for mushrooms because like most people, they were nervous and scared as they should be. So they had a couple mushrooms that they knew, but not many. Um, you know, they kind of eked it out for a while and then they had us kids and dad would hunt for the food, like literally all the, all the meat dad hunted and mom grew a massive vegetable garden. And as a kid, I was fishing and my sister was, you know, picking clover blossoms or tending the bees or whatever had to be done, the goats, the milk cow, all that. So as kids, we were like sent out with little baskets or little jars and like, you know, don't come back until it's full of morels or don't come back till it's full of clover blossoms, dad's favorite tea or rose hips or whatever it was. And uh, interestingly enough, my wife and business partner at the same time, although we don't know each other, She's getting dragged around by her father, a Polish upbringing in northeastern Alberta, an avid wild mushroom enthusiast, you know, oh, we're going picking mushrooms again with dad type of thing. And then, you know, I got into forestry and, and whatnot, but a big draw for me of the industry to start with was um, the freedom of the wild for one. It was nature, you know, I've gr grown up in nature. Nature is my happy place. And as a young scrappy bush rat from the interior plateau Chilcotin, you know, when the light bulb went off that you could make money out of picking mushrooms out of the bush, it was kind of a no brainer because then you're like, not only are you your own boss, but there's a gold rush associated with it because, you know, I got into it at a time 
like professionally into it at a time when matsutake or pine mushrooms was the latest craze just at the tail end of the 80s when these things were going for hundreds of dollars a pound and so i mean we'd been picking them with my grandma since i could walk she'd come up every september and we'd go pick matsutake for soup or whatever but then all of a sudden it was like oh we can pick these and sell them down the road and so we you know i started doing that as a young man just just in the fall and um next thing you know i was chartering helicopters to do it and it was fun and it was big and challenging and and um and it was that kind of gold rush you could make it really big i mean i never did make it really big i um in that sense but uh so that's kind of how the personal interest of it was and then there's another whole interest of how that became into a business with me and my wife and that and that's even a longer story but um i'm going to leave room for another question from you maybe or if you want me to keep going on that no well i definitely want to dig into that i definitely want to dig into you know the starting of your business because i think that's such an interesting concept you had this realization that hey you know out of all these things that i'm interested in doing being out in the wild, being out in nature, I can actually make a living doing this too, if I could harvest, you know, wild mushrooms. And it's a very unique skill. And it's a thing that a lot of people are afraid of or, or think is difficult. But I think one thing that you mentioned that I want to dig into is you talked about this idea of, yeah, you can make money. It is, you know, you mentioned gold rush, but it's not as easy as people think it is. I mean, I think that's the same as gold, right? It's really difficult to actually find uh, can you talk about that a little bit about like how difficult it actually is? I can. And that's the beauty of it actually. And what I was drawn to, like, you have to remember, I was a, I was a faller logger doing forestry contracts since I was 18. I was a tree topper on the West coast for 10 years, knocking off huge tops on big trees and like packing shotguns around in the woods for bears. Even as a young man, just if you're hiking, Picking wild mushrooms was like, so all my forestry training, I got to use all that for all the maps and all the topo reading of, of your uh, aerial photos and everything and timber types and picking out zones. So it was like everything I learned in forestry could be applied to overlay, but now I'm hunting for something that's worth money. And yeah, it's terribly dangerous and terribly isolated and, and, um, the risks that go with being in remote areas by yourself and like all the fun stuff that like a scrappy bush rat like me loved. Like you'd have to go out there and your truck would break down. You'd spend a couple of days there and you'd have to deal with these mushrooms or just all the logistics that you'd have to create around <laughs> just some mushrooms. And um, the other aspect to that industry is at the time, and it still does exist to some degree, but this was, um, I mean, people got shot. This was, wow. this, you could walk into a patch that was somebody else's mushroom patch that they'd been grooming, keeping. So for those that don't know, these pine mushrooms grow in the same spot in old growth trees, forests, and people will pick the mushroom and cover the spot all back up with the moss and stuff. So you can't see that there's been anybody there tending these mushrooms because they're not really visible. You got to be looking for these bumps under the moss. And you stumble across an area and you start picking and if you're not that remote and it could be somebody else's zone and everybody's packing rifles for all the grizzlies and wildlife and cougars and everything. And people literally did get shot back in those days because there could be $30,000 cash money, you know, sitting there on the ground and people would have altercations. Wow. I never had any of that, but that's, that was the rea reality on the ground. You also had, you could load up your truck with all these mushrooms that you've been picking and you're going back out maybe for another pack load. You've got, maybe you've only got $200 sitting in your truck in the back of your unlocked canopy. Maybe you've got 4,000 bucks, depends on the price that day. So you're always, you're listening for other vehicles. You might have other people coming in and poking around and, and these mushrooms equal cash. It's like, I mean, I don't know exactly what you'd equate it to in the world today, but like a basket of mushrooms that weighs about 15 pounds of pine mushrooms, you know, that was, well, at 
Last price I can remember doing back in the heyday, $87 a pound, 87 times 15. One basket of mushrooms, you can just walk over there with it. So those little layers and intricacies of, of that, that was great. And then getting helicopters involved and smaller crews and my dad and yeah, the, that was a lot of fun. But I rapidly learned that it was full of uh, full of middlemen, prices set by overseas players, and needed to do my own thing. And my own thing wasn't just being another guy who wanted to ship pine mushrooms direct to Japan and cut out the middleman. I wanted to do something real different, and uh, that's what I did. And and so you're talking. So you're, when you're talking about pine mushrooms, uh, for the people listening, so you're talking about matsutake. Yeah. And that is a rare mushroom. Well, I guess rare depending on where you are, right? That uh, can't be cultivated, so it needs to be wild harvested, which is you know, a, a good theme for a lot of the mushrooms that you, uh, that you, that you harvest, they can't be cultivated and that's what makes them so special. But I, I really want to dig into this hyper competitiveness a little bit, because it seems like, you know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Some people obviously thrive in that environment and are able to handle it. And some people that's a major turnoff. It's like, well, I don't want to have to be looking over my shoulder to make sure nobody's got a gun pointed at me and, and, and say they thought I was a bear and steal all my mushrooms. But when you say, um, you know, if you were accidentally on somebody else's patch or something like this, that's not a patch that somebody owns. It's just like something out in the wild where they happen to know where that environment was and they're maybe keeping it secret. Is it like, is the secrecy of your locations hyper competitive as well? Is that a big part of it? Yeah. Well, for that particular mushroom in those days, absolutely. <clears throat> but, um, by a patch, yes, it's a wild spot in the bush, but it can be somebody's patch just by the fact that, you know, you just, if you're in that group of people in that time, you just know that, oh, that's where Bob likes to go. So, if you know, if you go over there to where Bob is and you bump into Bob, I mean, what are you doing in Bob's patch in the first place? Which leads into the, like the lies that are wrapped in, an, in enigmas shrouded in untruths, which are passed around the campfires in the evening, because you could tell somebody where you're going, but what you're actually doing is trying to claim that area by saying, that's where I am, but it's actually the Wild West and it's free. So some people might say, I don't give a shit if you're going there. If you're, I see what you're coming in with every day and now I know where you're going, so I'm going to follow you. So that type of stuff gets real old for people real fast. I don't have a taste for it really at all. And um, yeah, after a few years of that, got into hiring helicopters, spending the big money to just totally do my own thing. You know, find a valley in the coastal mountains and just do my own thing, have zero issues with any of that. And even to this day, when we do, you know, cruise for morel harvesting, I don't go right into the fires where everybody is and where the shanty towns are set up. I stay well out of the burn, well out of the area, drama free. I do not like any of that mushroom drama anymore. It doesn't float my boat, but I can see why some people really still like it and like all that, you know, that wild west action. Yeah, I can see that. Well, even not though, you mentioned like uh, hiring helicopters to go fly out and hunt Matsutake. I mean, that's... That's pretty cool. I think a lot of people would think that's pretty neat to hop on a helicopter, go find a valley. But when you're investing so much into it, are you worried about getting skunked? Like how sure are you when you when you fly, you know, fly a helicopter into a location that you're going to hit gold or or sometimes you don't find anything or or how does that work? I mean, there's a couple of YouTube videos on my YouTube channel that kind of condense at least one of those trips um where we're just doing a scout and yeah, I mean, of course it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of, and some guessing, but no, at $2,500 an hour for a helicopter and you're doing a minimum one hour um, charge, then yeah, no, you're not just flying around hoping for the best. You've got a pretty good hunch. You've, you've put in some legwork prior to that, but, but I mean, Matsutake is not really an area of our business that we focus you know, maybe 2% of our time and energy in, in that now. And a, and we'll get into this later, but a lot of what we do in terms of this has changed as we've grown because I'm not the guy out there running around, you know, 
uh, sticking mushrooms in buckets and neither is my wife. We, we were, but now we have trained up enough people to get us the product that we need that where um, they have, they're doing that and they love that. And we're, we wear other hats that it takes in order to sell this product, to make these 16 different SKUs, 16 mm -hmm. different retail products. Yeah. Let's, so yeah, it, it's evolved and changed a lot. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, so Untamed Feast, and I have some of your products in front of me here. This is the uh, the mushroom soup. Uh, this is the, the mushroom risotto. Um, this one is the mushroom meat. I think, uh, what's this one here? I think it's a sauce. Yes, a wild mushroom sauce. So we had these at the office and we cooked it up and had an untamed feast of our own here at the office. And it was all awesome. Really, really good products. Um, and the, so the first time I ever saw this, uh, your company, Eric, was actually on a television show in Canada called Dragon's Den. And it would have been quite a while ago now. I don't remember exactly. But was that kind of the start of, of Untamed Feast as a business? Or how did it evolve from, you know, you hunting mushrooms in the wild, having this idea that you don't want to just sell directly to Japan, you want to do something a little bit different? How did that evolve from where that was to where you are at today with Untamed Feast? Yeah, so Dragon's Den was six or seven years ago. Um, no, that wasn't the start of Untamed Feast. That happened years earlier. And how that started actually was my wife and partner Michelle and I were out uh, on my trap line in uh, central BC, out west of Williams Lake towards Villa Coola, and we were slaying the pine mushrooms. And we had picked like a good amount, like, in my memory it's a truckload but it was probably not quite a truckload but the price of pine mushrooms that fall this is september was 50 dollars a pound and so we had i don't know let's just pretend that we had 10 or fifteen thousand bucks worth of pine mushrooms in the back of the pickup truck after a couple of days picking Remember, I know these places like the back of my hand. I've been picking there since I was a kid. I didn't just walk out there with Michelle and we picked 10 or 15 grand. We knew right when to be there and exactly where to be. Um, we took them up to the buyer. We're just going to sell for cash in Anaheim Lake, which is further west towards Bella Coola on that one-way highway that goes out there. And the price had dropped from $50 a pound to $1 a pound overnight. And so there's one store in town, and it's the everything store. I think their motto is, if you, if we don't have it, you don't need it. But it's just a country store, you know, and they got a liquor store thing. And I rented the cold beer and wine cooler on a hunch um, and just stored all the mushrooms there. And me and Michelle sat in town and, uh, <laughs> not a town, we drove around on the dusty roads and stayed at a buddy's place and waited. And, you know, you got, pine mushrooms are pretty good. You got probably, you could wait three, four, five days. And the price just kept falling. It never went close back to 50 bucks a pound or anything. So me and Michelle were at this, my buddy's place, uh, Austin. And he started his own wild mushroom company, actually. Um, we might get back to that. We grew up picking mushrooms together too. But, but I found a new roll of chicken wire out behind a barn. And me and Michelle took all these pine mushrooms and we washed them individually by hand. I mean, this is our first time drying mushrooms. You don't really know what we're doing, but we washed them, sliced them, graded them. You know, if there's any worm damage that got chucked in the the compost or whatever. And dried these things in the sun on chicken wire. And um, then it was time to get back to reality at some point and took all these dried mushrooms home to Vancouver Island, which is where we lived and started the business. And I pounded the pavement trying to sell these dried Matsutake pine mushrooms. You know, it's a thing in Japan, so every sushi joint, anything you could imagine, Japanese grocery store, nobody wanted these dried pines, man. Nobody wanted them. But I learned that in my process of asking people to buy these dried mushrooms, they would ask me, the odd one would say, hey, I don't want that, but do you have any dried morel mushrooms? Or do you have any dried chanterelle mushrooms? Or blah, 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 blah. So I was like, geez, I've been picking those for a while. I know where they grow, but I don't have any of that. So that was kind of the beginning of Untamed Feast. Uh, Michelle and I started hobby picking and, and drying uh, a little bit and selling them in farmer's markets in little bags. 
my grandmother died and left me 5,000 bucks and I built a mushroom dryer, a mobile mushroom dryer. I bought a brand new six by eight cargo trailer and I put in a wood stove and built a bunch of racks and fans and had, it was all fancy overbuilt, but, uh, and started taking that out into the bush. I was still logging at the time, but on the weekends I'd go up to where I'd been in the treetops logging. They could see the chanterelles, you know, a hundred feet below me on the forest floor. And I'd, I'd go out on the weekends and pick them and sell some to restaurants to pay for the gas and dry the other ones and try selling them at farmer's markets. So that was kind of the beginning. And, and like I said, Michelle had had that experience with her dad from picking wild mushrooms too. And so it was kind of this nice full circle and, but it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Um, it wasn't full time. And, um, it was very hard to get into our first grocery store. Uh, you had to have, well, <clears throat> first off, I'd say that in those days, and I mean, I'm not a dinosaur, I'm 44. Let's call this 15, 17 years ago, something like that. It was, um, wild mushrooms were still scary. I mean, this is not Europe. We're not, we have Europe, a lot of European blood over here in Canada because we're all immigrants, but, um, well, most of us, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, scary. What if you're picking the wrong mushroom? Aren't mushrooms bad? Like, you know, at a farmer's market, it wasn't what it is now. You go and say, oh, he's got some mushrooms. This is great. Look at all these wonderful mushrooms. It's like, are you sure I'm not going to die? Yeah. You know, that that was more kind of the scene. And in order to sell in retail stores, we had to have liability insurance. But we couldn't get liability insurance because because we didn't have any sales. There's this weird little gray box you get stuck in. So I don't have any sales, so I can't get liability insurance, but I can't get liability insurance because I don't have any sales. Mm -hmm. So we got that fixed. We got one store in Victoria took us in under their liability insurance. Uh, um, that was great. That was market on Yates. And what was that first product that you um, sold in the store? Oh, it was, uh, it was dry morel mushrooms and it was dry porcini mushrooms. And we had a forest mix, which is called forest blend now. And there is one other one which has evolved. It was a smoked mushroom mix, which is now alder smoked, staged in a wine barrel mushroom. So it was those four core. And what? And were you called Untamed Feast at the time when you first got in? Was it already under that name? No, in those days it was 100 Mile Wild Food. Okay. I had read the book 100 mild diet or something like that and i thought man that is like yeah everybody should eat that way and i started boiling down my own salt water on the coast and making my own salt and and selling local foods and mushrooms and stinging nettle and all that stuff i want to quickly dig in though too because a lot of people when they hear about wild mushrooms or wild harvested mushrooms you're right there there is a lot of what I call mycophobia or just a fear of mushrooms specifically around wild mushrooms. And, and people have this idea that if you go pick a wild mushroom, there's a really good chance that it's going to kill you, which is not true at all. And it's probably even more true of plants than it is of mushrooms. But aside from that topic, like one of the questions that we were getting, um, when saying we were going to do this interview, people were saying, well, how do they know, like, how do they know they're not poisonous mushrooms? How do you know you don't get a poisonous mushroom in the blend somewhere tossed into the basket? How do you answer that question? Well, I mean, every mushroom's edible once. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <Yeah. laughs> no, okay. Uh, just all jokes aside, because it is a serious topic. So let's imagine you're out there picking mushrooms, and 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 let's put it in like the big industrial perspective, where say you're up in Terrace, Kitimat, Houston area in September, October, and there's you know 10, 15 cash buyers scattered around that are buying the wild goods off of the mushroom pickers. Now, 99% of these mushroom pickers are people who have been doing this for a long time and they have quite a bit of pride in their work. 1% or whatever the, if I said 95, 5%, if I said 99, 1%, I forget what I said. Those are, yeah, they're just some people that showed up and they want to pick some wild mushrooms. But these people are coming into these buyers and A, the person picking the mushroom knows what they're picking. And B, the buyer sees every single mushroom there. Then the buyer ships those mushrooms down to a facility in the lower mainland or whatever, or somewhere like us, or they ship them to their dryer or to their some other facility. And again, they're looked at. But 
let's go back to the beginning. The wrong mushroom doesn't even get in the mushroom picker's basket for the 99% because it's like, like, I guess a good analogy is you are an avid produce person. Your life is produce. You do nothing but pick produce. You've, been, you've spent 10 years picking fruit in the Okanagan. You did a tour in Oregon, California. Your life is fruit and vegetables. And I tell you, uh, go pick me a basket of oranges out of Sobeys. You know, this person doesn't return with a bunch of oranges and one apple in there. And if they did, they'd feel embarrassed about it. And the buyer would be like, well, what the hell are you doing? Like, why'd you put it? I didn't want an apple in there. Right. So it just doesn't happen. Now, let's let's think of a more edgy scenario where there's maybe like a bad person and they want to harm some other person. And so they want to throw something in there that's bad. Again, it's going to be seen right away. You're, you are a produce expert. It's what you do all day long. Nobody gets an apple past you when it's supposed to be an orange. And to people who don't know mushrooms, they're like, oh, but they all look so similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, how could you? But they really don't. You have to imagine you're in that. Uh, I mean, I assume it's like anything else. Like if you code and then some line of code comes across and you're like, that's not supposed to be here. Control, alt, delete. Yeah. You know, you just see it. Now, even in dried mushrooms, so even if it got through the five to 10 hands to where now it's a dried product, say somebody imports the mushrooms from somewhere and they're all dried and whatever, and they come across a sorting table. Yeah, you just, you know, you notice it, you see it and it never happens anyway, but you would. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because yeah, for people who maybe aren't familiar with mushrooms, you're right. They're like, oh, all these mushrooms look the same. And yeah, you know, there are some genuses of mushrooms or some species that might be hard to tell apart, but these are like the obscure mushrooms that nobody uses for gourmet or medicinal purposes. But when you're talking about morel mushrooms or chanterelle mushrooms or porcinis or um, matsutake or any of these mushrooms, it's like, yeah, you're not going to misidentify those. It just, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, the other important thing to note that I don't think a lot of people realize is they imagine like, okay, it's bountiful fall season and there's there's 4,000 species of mushrooms out there and there's people running around picking them all and shoving them in the same bucket. What's happening usually is a very focused effort after one species. At certain times of the year, you might, sure, you might be picking four different kinds, which are going in totally different buckets and baskets, by the way, because they have different prices. A blue chanterelle up in Kitimat is going to stain your matsutake mushrooms, so they don't go anywhere near each other. But mostly what's happening is you're targeting a mushroom. So of the, say, the 16 to 20 to 30 types of mushrooms that picker might see on the forest floor that day, they're only picking that one kind. They don't care about the rest of them. They're irrelevant. So they're not even touching them. They're not going, there's no price on them. They're not desired they're done like for the season say and so they've moved on to another one it's just the same as like going into an orchard and only picking grapes because it's grape season and leaving the wrinkly apples on the apple trees alone we're not going to apples yeah there's apples over there but we're not doing apples right now yeah right so the truck and the people and the pickers come back they come back with the type of mushroom they're out to get only for a short window in certain spots in the world is there maybe four or five types of at once now of course there's going to be somebody out there who says well one time i would there were six kinds but whatever sure but the vast majority is you know when we're picking morels for two months we're picking morels we're not picking anything else sure the red top scaber stems are up starting in june but there's we don't we're, and that's a great mushroom but we're not there for it it's not part of our process as we're dealing with morels so it's it's the apples when you're picking grapes i hope that kind of helps and answers no it really does and um I, I think that is a great analogy and also because it's kind of a cliche you know the difference of apples and oranges but it is very similar right i mean you're not going to mix up a porcini and a chanterelle because just the same as you wouldn't mix up an apple or an orange um yeah but i did kind of divert there oh, sorry go ahead i just want to add to that i hope that everyone understands i am the most fearful mushroom type person also you will in encounter i do not put anything into my body that is any what risky so i don't want to brush 
don't take this as I brush it off as it's not a risk. I mean it's not a risk. I don't try a new mushroom lightly. If I'm going to try a new mushroom, I've studied the hell out of it. And I've, I've been with people who actively pick it. I do never learn a new mushroom. Even myself as an expert who's been in this game my whole life, go ID a new mushroom from a book, find it edible, or from the internet, and go imbibe in such a culinary treat. That is, that is anxiety level 10 for me. And so that's how everybody should be. If you have to look it up in a book, you're actually not ready to eat it. Yep. That's a really good point. And uh, yeah, the, the way you learn how to go hunt for and identify to the level in which you're comfortable eating a wild mushroom, you're right, is not through a book. It's not through a YouTube video. It's going out with somebody who's got years of experience or whatever. Mushroom clubs are great for this kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I personally haven't had a ton of experience wild harvesting and foraging mushrooms until I went out with some groups, even with like morel mushrooms, right? In the early days or, or more recently with chanterelles and porcinis and, and telluride. Because at the end of the day, there is no mushroom so delicious that you want to risk uh, not only death with, you know, some of the super rare poisonous mushrooms, but even just kind of some kind of discomfort. I mean, it's, at some point in time, Somebody had to try these mushrooms for the first time, but it sure as hell isn't going to be me. <laughs> Sounds like it isn't going to be you. And uh, you're right. There's a, there's a lot of ways you can enjoy wild mushrooms without having to take any risk whatsoever. Yeah, life's too short. It's just food. And it, the same applies for wild berries and sticks and roots. So it's the same thing. Like we all love wild raspberries and we go pick them because we know what they are. But we don't go chuck random red berries in our mouth because we think they might be tasty. Like that would be nuts, right? It's just not worth well, it. Well, that would be berries, not nuts, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, those are, those are really good points. I'm, I'm glad we did that, but I do want to divert back to uh, the story of Untamed Feast because I really took you on a tangent there. So you got into your first grocery store um, and then it sounds like, you know, you've, you've continued to build the business. The, the dragon's den appearance because i guess if people search on tim feast they might see that come up how is that did that have a major impact on on the business as a whole was that just kind of a good experience or, or can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah well i mean that was great that was that was um geez where how do i encapsulate dragon's den so for years michelle and i had been told oh you guys have such an interesting unique business you should go on dragon's den and we just kind of ignored that because, well, um, geez, I don't know why we ignored it, but eventually we decided, oh yeah, okay, we'll go pitch. And so what happens is you pitch to like some CBC staff that come to a town near you. I was on Salt Spring Island at the time. We lived in Crofton where we started the business on Vancouver Island. And so we went over to Salt Spring and did our little pitch and they liked it. And next thing you know, it was okay, fly your butts to Toronto and and film and and uh i mean michelle i i mean i'm gonna give her like 99 percent of the credit on this because i was just the the guy who talked for the most part she had us dialed in so she she got us thinking about what we wanted from the experience uh what we were gonna say how we we're gonna be prepped and organized for whatever questions were thrown at us and it went really well. I remember getting mic'd up before you walk down those stairs and you're a silhouette like what you see on TV and like, now oh, Eric and Michelle from Vancouver Island, blah, blah, blah. And I took a deep breath in and I filled all these pins and needle needles. It was just like, <laughs> like oh, because at that moment, I kind of realized that I had Untamed Feast that was in you know, our hands, I was just putting it on national television, some dragons to slay yeah, or, or to, you know, make our day. And, you know, thank God they were really good. They were really into it. I felt we got carried through that show on angels wings. Um, they loved it. We had four offers and went with Arlene on the show and cause they could have said, well, what if you, kill somebody with your mushrooms and it could have gone that way and turned into a you know a defensive note we know what we're doing this is safe it's been enjoyed in european culinary circles forever 
and we're just introducing it here. It's not new food. But um, so yeah, and then that's around the time we incorporated. Um, so if there's any savvy business people listening to this, make sure you're incorporated before you go on a show like Dragon's Den. I'm going to tell you why. We're a small family business. We still are. You know, it's me and me and my partner, wife Michelle, and we have some part-time staff um, that come in and help us manufacture and do, you know, trade shows and food shows with us, like Chelsea and George and a few others. But what happened was we were driving carloads of online orders to the Canada Post every day, like. Oh, big time. No, we're online orders up the yin yang. Let's not even talk about what, like how we, we're going to manage supply and stuff at some point. But so we're making money and lots of it all of a sudden. And <laughs> we're still in personal income tax rate land. <laughs> so when that, when the dust settled from that experience, although we'd had our biggest year ever, we lost almost all of it to tax because we weren't incorporated yet and it was all taxed under personal income. So we go to what, 47% or 52% or whatever it was oh minus gosh. your cost of goods and yeah. whatever. So if you're going to do something like that and you know, it's going to be a hit, get incorporated first. So you're in a lower tax bracket and blah, blah, blah. Um, Dragon's Den was really interesting because it, um, you know, I've been self-employed a long time. I've been in other businesses before this. I've had little businesses since I was a kid. Sold used cars in the parking lot at high school instead of going to class. I mean, that's, I'm an entrepreneur. But I learned that, oh, okay, big business is a little different. And I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm not really super savvy, sneaky, uh, industrious, gonna step on your face to get what I want. <laughs> and business is full of that. So that's another cautionary note, and that's never changed. You can hear about it. And I'm not saying that, like, say Arlene was like this or anybody was like that. It's just like, oh, welcome to the real world where big decisions happen fast and you should read the fine print, but you hardly have time and there's going to be pressure. And mm -hmm. But to coalesce that experience, um, we ended up – after a year of due diligence, meaning so Arlene and her team has their fingers in our books. And um, there's all a bunch of stuff in there where they initially say, no, you're not going to make any money at that. To then they change their mind and they say, yes, can we still do it? If you haven't partnered with somebody else to restructuring of the deal, to us saying no, to us saying yes, to blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, we called up Arlene and broke up and said, nope, we're just not going to, we're just not going to go down this road because, and here's the real reason why we could have a lot more money. If we went with Arlene, we could have done that. We could have structured things where it's not so much uh, just scalable in a different way. But what we learned was our strong suit was marketing and Arlene is your marketing person on dragons. Then. Okay. Like every dragon there has a thing. And we thought we wanted Arlene for marketing, mm -hmm. but it, we, after training her people about our product and about how we do everything and what our business model is and what our life is like, we realized our strong suit was already marketing and it made no sense to, to exchange equity for marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, you know, we couldn't just bang out a zillion packages of untamed feast mushroom soup tomorrow because you know, we're dealing in a wild sector in an emerging smaller industry here. So, yeah. So, yeah. So that's how it kind of shook down. Uh, zero regrets. Wonderful experience. Learned a lot. Continue to learn. Mm -hmm. And um, and no bad blood anywhere. I'd like to think I could still text Arlene and say, how's it going? I should do that. I haven't done that in a while. Maybe she watches the mushroom show and she'll reach out. I don't know. It's, it's possible. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's it's so much to dig into there because I think you know, one of the things that you really hit on was, um, you know, people see businesses from the outside and it seems like such a simple machine, right? Like, okay, you guys harvest wild mushrooms, you put them in a bag, you sell them. There's so much more that goes into it, um, especially when you're getting outside investors involved. And the other thing too, with, with Dragon's Den, and for the people watching this in the US, it's the Canada's version of Shark Tank. Um, very similar, very similar setup. 
a lot of those deals don't actually get done at the end of the day. So it looks like something is going to happen. You make all these great connections, but through this process of, of due diligence, um, it doesn't always make sense. And I think it's a pretty low percentage of the deals that actually go through. And it could be for a million different reasons. And in your case, you, you decided for your business personally, et cetera, it didn't make a lot of sense, but there could be a million reasons why it doesn't necessarily make sense for the deal to go through. Yeah. And the good part of it was that we had it national exposure that the online sales blew through the roof. And like I said, with taxes, we didn't make any money on that, but we got our product into so many people's hands that year. We got to try our stuff that continue to order, you know? So yeah. that was big for online sales. Like if you launch a brand new online store, at least when we did, we we're, we were excited to, you know, maybe sell a bag of mushrooms a week or something, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, nowadays we're shipping every day. And before Dragon's Den, or Dragon's Den was a big part of that because you just get your product in so many more people's hands. And if you have a good product, like like we do, uh, people will go, mm, yum, I will take more. Yeah, people be like, oh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't even know. I A lot of people might not have even heard of this kind of food before. And then they, they're exposed to it, they see it, they love it. And then you have word of mouth referrals, all that kind of stuff. And I've definitely seen more and more Untamed Feast on the shelves, in on the grocery store shelves, uh, walking around. So let's talk a little bit about that, about your products. Um, you, you said you started off just with dried wild mushrooms, but now you have some more kind of value added products like the soups and the sauces and the mushroom meat. Um, talk about that evolution a little bit. How did you go from just selling dried mushrooms to starting to do these more complex kind of consumer products? Well, I think, <clears throat> I mean, it all starts because of, uh, I mean, the mushrooms are the thing that, pays the bills, so to speak. But the idea is that, you know, nature has the best food slash medicine. So back in the days when I was picking chanterelles and selling them to chefs on Vancouver Island and drying some for our little baggies at the farmer's market, I was also picking a lot of stinging nettle, you know, to sell to chefs. Um, you know, so now we, we harvest and dry a lot of stinging nail, nettle in Canada and that goes in our products because A, it's good for you it's one of the most nutrient dense plants out there it doesn't sting you once it's dried and stuff but it has like natural serotonin and all that stuff so nature's got all these great things and we wanted to incorporate that so wild rice from northern canada that's uh you know that goes in well we we sell it just as is but also it goes in one of our soups our wild mushroom rice soup so seaweed's another one we're like well you know uh, seaweed is good for you. It's there's some wild seaweed and there's some cultivated ones, but let's sell the wild one. And so we we have a couple different seaweed products. Um, and the I think the biggest change though, the biggest hurdle and success story um, was moving towards what we call our ready to feast packages, and that's like the mushroom meat and the porcini or the mushroom risottos and the soups. So that's where we're taking these great mushrooms and, you know, we grind them up here in house and we make our own spice mixture and everything gets it's a dry mix in a bag that people take to make it home or on their tailgate camping or whatever they're going to do with it. Um, that, that was, that's fun. It's really interesting to come up with these products and, and um, sourcing the ingredients and finding a, a way that they're kind of, you know, to the best that you can always taste the same. So consistency, which is challenging in this industry. And um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought there a little bit, but that's where the meat and potatoes is now. So we still sell the dried mushroom line and the wild rice and the seaweed, but the, the main draw and what you're seeing out there in a lot of grocery stores nowadays is these ready to feast packages and the mushroom meat. That's the new brainchild couple years came out and uh, it's yeah maybe a couple years now just under that's great that's again it's a dry mix add hot water let it sit mix it up maybe throw an egg in it and and make four big burger patties or make some ground meat for and it's mushroom based and so things like that because the idea is get mu mushrooms are like i'm i'm a paul stamets 
you know, kind of fan in terms of like, these things are going to save the world. Like, you know, when Elon Musk eventually colonizes Mars, mushrooms are going to be like the staple food out there. Like mushrooms are and their environmental mediation of eating old oil. And so they're medicinal, mm -hmm. they're healthy, mm -hmm. they're chock full of vitamins and all that. They grow just about anywhere. They're, they're going to save everything. Mushrooms are awesome. Yeah. So we, yeah, I, 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 we want to get that into into every kind of little avenue um, and make it taste great and be fun. I agree, and I think you've done a great job. That we made meatballs out of this, by the way. And uh, my favorite was probably the mushroom soup, but maybe it was kind of on a because it was a cold day that we were eating, but it was it was really delicious. Uh, mushrooms on Mars. I mean, why not? Elon Musk. Maybe we could change his name and uh, see if see if he'd be interested in, in taking part. Um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, I'm super excited about about all the products. They were they were awesome. I think you've done such a cool job, you know, growing your company to where it is today. I did want to talk a little bit about to the people who are listening. Let's dive in specifically about some of these mushrooms. Obviously starting with the morel because you did mention earlier that um uh, you know, you don't go for the burn sites and stuff like this, but specifically about the morel. If people don't know about harvesting uh morel mushrooms, what is it like harvesting morel mushrooms? Where should people be looking? What are some of the unique aspects that make this such a special mushroom that people are kind of obsessed with? Right. Well, um, people should never go and look for morels because um, they should just buy them from us. <laughs> right. And it's very, very dangerous. No. Okay, yeah, yeah so for sure. We, we do. We do go to the burn. I mean, I don't personally go anymore other than to check up on suppliers now of mine but so how it worked traditionally is you go out to areas that were burned in forest fires the year previously so it's april almost april 2022 today so uh burns that burned last summer the morel pickers will be out on this spring and it usually starts around mid-may so in a couple months the areas that burned last year now it's not just any fire it, it it's a real specific tree type, you know, biogeoclimatic zone and the rest of it. And even a fire, so an area that's been all burned out, uh, if you're lucky, a really good fire, only 20% of that total hectareage that's burned is productive ground for morels. But the reason the morels come, because the trees are dead. Now, it doesn't matter that it's a fire. If it was all blow down, if there was a 300 hectare swath of timber that got blown down in a windstorm that would make morels too or a cut block does it but not very good and i'll get to that in a minute or uh uh beetle kill you know will kill a whole whack of trees too so what happens is the mushroom as anybody watching the show must know what mycelium is so the mycelium is connected to the tree roots joining all the trees together the internet of the forest and in this case although there's many overlaying types of mycelium of different mushrooms, the morels, the trees have died. And so the mushrooms are still alive down in the ground, not the mushrooms like that you're going to eat, but the mycelium. And so it knows its hosts have died. And a lot of them have died. It takes a big area. It can't just be a little burn. It has to stress that organism and say, oh, shucks, our hosts are dead. Let's quick use the last of the retreating resources coming out of the tree, the sap, full of carbohydrates and nutrients, gravity, the tree's dead, the sap is falling down into the roots. We're gonna use that energy to put up as many babies as we can, which is the mushroom. So it morphs itself into all these mushrooms up out of the forest floor to give off all their spores to go and recolonize somewhere else because the, the mycelium will stay where it is and new trees will grow and they'll attach to them and everything will be good. Fast forward 80 years. But the spores, it's a stress reaction to get the spores up. Now, a spore doesn't equal another mushroom in this case. That's very complicated, but a spore is going to go land somewhere. Maybe it'll colonize a plant and make a new association and then it has to have like sex with another mushroom and there's like I don't know, 107, a lot of sexes. It's hard to wrap your head around because humans just have two, but mushrooms have a lot. Right. So morel, morel mushrooms have a certain amount of sexes and they got to have sex somehow under the ground. Then they're capable of maybe creating more mushrooms. So 
we go to these burned areas, we cut our firewood, we cross our fingers, we're well versed in what we're looking for, what it always looks like on good fires that produce mushrooms. And sometimes you're lucky, and other times you've wasted a ton of fuel and a ton of people's time, and they just don't come, or they come to a degree that doesn't even pay for your fuel to get there, and you know. Um, so then the mushrooms are happening and you're drying them on site daily. Uh, we use big commercial dryers that we build with wood heat. Wood heat is the best. A little bit of sun drying is good because as the mushrooms sit in the sun, they absorb vitamin D. So it's a win-win. You're, you're doing a little bit of air drying and you're getting extra vitamin D into the product mm -hmm. because mushrooms like human skin in a weird way are one of the few things that absorb vitamin D from the sun. Yep. So then, then they're boxed up, like, and then traditionally we'd keep them on site and sweat about it while we're away from camp because you might have a hundred thousand dollars of shunt, uh, dried morels sitting there or whatever you're harvesting. But nowadays, I'll drop in on my on my cruise and pick up mushrooms and pay them, or if I have to, I might. It might be in a situation where I don't pay them every time I pick them up. Um. So yeah, that's kind of how it works for for morels. And there'll be numerous buyers buying for different companies and numerous people drying for different people or whatever. But I have people that I've trained who used to pick for me now run their own crews to supply me with the dry product I need because I can only wear 17 hats, not 18. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's 19, Eric. Come on. Let's be <laughs> honest about it. Yeah. Um, I do think that's fascinating, though. So people are looking for, and you know, this seems to be specific to morels, and I've never heard anybody explain it so succinctly, but this idea that they show up after a fire. And I think what most people think is like, well, wouldn't the fire also kill the mushroom? And it's like, no, because, you know, they're protected underground. And yes, you're right. All of a sudden their hosts are dead and they need to reproduce. So that's why they produce all these fruiting bodies. So are you actually actively, you know, during the winter, during the off season, looking at maps or fire maps or burn maps to see where to go and trying to scope it out? Or how do you, because some of these places might be not that easy to access. They might be, you know, is that, is that a whole process is finding the morale spots? Yeah, it's a huge process. And like, let's assume that you have road access. Let's assume you're not getting helicopters and slings involved at 2,500 bucks an hour. Let's assume that there's friendly places to run your mushroom dryers and that there's uh, wood to cut that you don't need to apply for a wood cutting license just to power your mushroom dryers. I mean, yeah, there's, there's tons of it. I don't spend any time on the maps anymore, um, but that was a wonderful part of my life for like at least 15 years. That's, I love that part, finding, finding the area where you're going to set your crews up. Um, but now that's a choice that my suppliers get to make, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I can, I can say, Hey, this spot looks good, but they're going to go where they want to go. Yep. And that's fine with me. But, but yeah, so reading the forest and knowing how that works and it's just experience. I mean, you're going to walk a burn in April and look at it and you're going to decide long before there's any mushrooms there. If you think that's when you, where you want to go, where you want to set up shop. and uh that's somebody who's doing it right if you're not doing it right and you just show up in late may because that's where everybody else is i mean that might work for you for a while but it actually always pays out to walk the ground assuming you know what you're looking for if you don't know what you're looking for that's irrelevant just head to a burn and hope for mushrooms now there's also natural morale so like here in alberta say you're going to go on a mushroom forage or something or you want to go find some morels. Morels will come naturally in the spring too. And again, it's about the sap flow. Okay. Mushrooms are all about the sap flow. So in the fall, sap is retreating down the trees. So the mushrooms, again, just like that analogy I said with the morel, the mushrooms that are getting, they're in a symbiotic relationship. They're getting carbohydrates and sugars from the saps of the tree. And in exchange, they're protecting those fine tree roots that they're connected to from other harmful funguses. So it's a it's a win-win situation, mushroom and tree. And in the fall, the sap's coming down. The mushroom has extra food, so it makes fruiting bodies like to make children. Like like let's just say a population of humans had a great harvest year, so they were able to reproduce more. It's the same thing. So in the spring, 
you got to imagine all these little trees, all these little poplars and stuff are the sap is going to go up. So the sap's going up and again, the to a way smaller degree, some mushrooms go, ooh, sap movement, food. Uh, we're going to make a little bit of um, uh, babies, a little bit of reproduction. So if you want to look for what we call natural morels, you go to like edges, say, the, where the forest is on the edge of a field and the sunshine comes in and there's a certain warming pattern that that sap is kind of moving up in those trees that are exposed to that southern sunlight or whatever. And that's where you can get some natural morels. And there's other locations too, but again, it's about sap movement. And as soon as that sap movement is over in the spring, so is the spring natural morel mm -hmm. um, harvest. Right. So in a burn in the spring, the sap is moving down because the trees have died. And in, in the natural living forest, the sap's moving up. And so there's a little bit of morels there too. Right. And I imagine the, the burn site morels are much more prolific and... It wouldn't make sense to harvest. Uh, would, would it make sense to harvest natural morels for, for example, for a business like yours, or is it just not abundant enough to, or predictable enough? It's never worked out for anybody in the industry to spend the time and money and resources to chase natural morels. That doesn't mean that you can't get lucky and go pick, say, 50, 100 pounds, maybe even of natural morels in a day if you got lucky and went to a certain spot. <coughs> but um, and I have, but in all my years, um, it, it just doesn't pay out. It doesn't last long. They're much more fragile mushrooms. They're mm -hmm. thinner cell mm -hmm. wall. They're more susceptible to pests mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Uh, there's a whole bunch of variables. They're delicious. They're the same. So in a burn, uh, the first morel is the conica that comes up. It's the little brown one. Some people call them blacks. That's the same as the natural morel that grows here in Alberta, say, in the spring. And then in a burn, it transitions where this mushroom morphs into three other types of morels, the blondes, the grays, and the greens. But the naturals, it's just the conicas, and then it's over. Yeah, and I, I noticed too, you're right, they are a lot more delicate, a lot thinner. Um, they're not like those big, sturdy burn morels that you get. Um, yeah. Really quick on that point, though, without diving into too much, but you mentioned uh, Conica, or you mentioned, uh, what do you think about not just the morel genus, but verpas or verpa bohemica, maybe a mushroom that'll show up maybe a week earlier. Some people say they're poisonous. Some people like to eat them. There seems to be a bit of a uh, two different camps. Where do you sit on the verpa bohemica or verpa train? So there's a very small market. For dried verpas, if you if one wanted to uh, pick and dry verpas, um, I don't eat verpas. Um, verpas have verpas flavor is blah. Anyway, it's it's nowhere as good as the morel. So yes, they're coming up just when the morels are kind of starting. Like on pretty much every burn mor morel site, if you go into like where there's some green timber in the areas just right, you're going to find some verpas too. Um, yeah, personally not a fan of them. I've dabbled around in it. I There was a time where I thought I could make some money at it and it would be a good thing to do, but it actually just always distracted me from where the real product was, which is the morel. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, they have to be dried. They shouldn't really be eaten fresh unless you cook them really well. And you'd have to check with Mike or... Robert, but I do, I think the Verpa has a tiny little bit of monomethylhydrazine in it too, like the, like the brain morel. And so it's, it's not toxic on its own in the little bit you're going to get, but it can build up over time and one day cause a problem for you. So like I said, I, I do not take any mushroom risk and thus like, I've probably eaten like one extremely well cooked, overcooked, practically burnt to rat shit Verpa in my life because uh, yeah, I just, why there's morels are 10 times better. So yeah. there, and a, there's a lot of confusion in that one because the, a lot of the Polish Ukrainian and Ukrainians, my background, wife, Polish background, they call them morels just cause that they call them morels. So morels could be a variety of things. Mm -hmm. Somebody might say, Oh, I picked a, a bucket full of morels over here. And I don't know, let's call it Glendon or St. Paul or somewhere Eastern. And it's like, no, they're actually verpas, but 
they like them. They've been picking them and eating them. There's no problem there. It's just, I think you get my point. It, it, it's not my shtick. I don't have a problem with it. Um, there's some great spots, man. Like I tell you what, I've seen some great spots and if I'll give away some spots right now, cause I'm never going to go chase them. But I remember mapping out and putting in quite a bit of time along the battle river, uh, towards, uh, or that would be the North Saskatchewan river towards North battlefield and stuff. There's some islands in there. And if you time that just right in the spring, that all that old cottonwood, that old growth cottonwood, that's going to be full of verpas because it's just like up around uh, Grand Prairie, just south of Grand Prairie, we're in all those big cottonwoods where it's Verpa City, man. You can go pick a lot of Verpas. But if you can do that, go pick morels and have 10 times the experience and make actually make money. So, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I think, I mean, I kind of have a soft spot for Verpa just because it's always the first mushroom I see. So it's always a little bit more exciting than anything else. But you're right. They're not nearly as good as morels. A lot of times they grow in similar places. If you can find Verpa. Do you like really, eating them? Not really. I can't really stand the smell of them. Uh, that's kind of the problem. They smell kind of kind of gross uh, and they're not super good. So like they're they're generally not worth it. But I like yeah, finding and let's them. Touch, let, let's touch on that. So you say the smell. Are you talking fresh or dry? Fresh. When you cut a fresh one, you just kind of like, it's got, okay. yeah. Well, no, note that if you're ever drying mushrooms and you're doing it in a, let's even say a small scale, like you're going to pick a bucket of mushrooms, you're going to take them home and dry them. The amount of spore load that you're going to put into your body is incredible and you won't see it. But verpas have a, oh, an incredible spore load. Pick one verpa and pick one morel and put them on a piece of white paper or something and go about your life for a couple of days and come back and look. And the spore load that comes off the verpa is all this rust colored spore. And there's so much of it compared to say <clears throat> a conica morel. Well, that's fine and dandy, but the, the, there's so much spore in those things where say you pick, you and your crew pick 300 pounds and you put that in the dryer, all that spore has to go somewhere. It's being ejected from that, drying unit into the air where you're living not like in your house but in a camp outside but the spore load on that stuff is extremely high too hmm. and when people get into drying they're gonna like oh i picked 10 pounds of verpas i'm gonna put them in my little tray dehydrator on the on the counter at the house and go about their life and they're run, you know just be careful of that that's a serious spore load interesting i wouldn't have thought of that just because like you don't see the spores as much as you would on an oyster mushroom or something like that. But, um, that's a little experiment I'm going to have to do now. See the spore load <coughs> on the Verpa. Um, so, so morels are obviously the big one and they're the first to show up in the spring and they're, they're a huge part of, of, of what you guys do. Next one I wanted to talk about really quickly was porcini or Belita sedulis. And the reason I want to talk about that one is because I thought for some reason they did not grow in Alberta. And I don't know if it was last summer or the summer before I actually found one. I thought it was, uh, you know, Lacinum or something. I looked at it. I was like, holy crap, that's a King Belit. That's a uh, Belita sedulis. And it was amazing to me to see it. But I mean, typically they don't grow as much here, but I guess they grow a lot more, you know, on in probably British Columbia. Do you have a lot of experience picking Porcini or Belita sedulis? And what are some of your thoughts around that one? I have a ton of experience picking Porcini, <clears throat> Belita sedulis. I've only ever picked one in Alberta. Okay. So we're, we, but, our, our, our hit rate but, is the same in Alberta then. <laughs> yeah. But I'm never hunting for Porcini in Alberta. Right. So they love the coast. They love, they love kind of an old growth mix on the coast and stuff. But where all the Belitis in Canada and the United States is done is high altitude uh, spruce. So if you want to find Belitis edulis, you're after blue spruce, Engelman spruce, whatever. Blue spruce is better. High altitude midsummer. So this crop starts in July, high altitude. So when you're going over mountain passes in the summer, that's when you're hunting for porcini. So yes, in the fall, in lower elevation coastal spots, you can have some amazing Porcini harvest too. Like you could go to Port Renfrew in October into the big old 
spruce forest down in there and you could slay away. But the real hard like apple, beautiful porcini, that's high altitude stuff. The stuff on the coast is a lot more, um, well, it grows bigger, um, but it's also, what would the word be? It's not as uh, dense. Mm -hmm. Spongy. And the lack of, yeah, and the lack of density increases the um, pest issue. Yeah. And porcini is like, like you have to hit that mushroom perfectly. In fact, when we're, when we're picking porcini, you're not coming in at the end of the day with your porcini mushrooms to slice them up and dry them. You're coming in every time you have around 10 pounds or so because those need to be processed uh, throughout the day. Mm -hmm. You can't, you, as soon as you pick a porcini mushroom that you think is rock hard and you put it in your bucket and you stumble around the bush for a few hours, any larva or anything that might be in that mushroom gets excited and will start eating its way through. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking like a centipede, like eating its way through, but I mean, little tiny tip of a pen size things will start to go nuts in those mushrooms after disturbance. So our stuff is processed multiple times during the day. It's cut in half right there in the field and, and inspected in half and be like, okay, this one has a little bit of insect damage or whatever. So that's B grade. This one is A grade. And then they're sliced with a special machine and put on racks all at the same time, multiple times per day and into the dryer immediately. If you don't do that, you end up with like what you see most porcini product on the market, a bug eaten, weird, nasty looking thing that came from uh, I want to be polite here. Um, well, it came from, I think, product of Macedonia is how most of the companies put it now, mm -hmm. which is like a broad idea of a place. But I guess what you're saying is a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the stuff I've heard, actually, there were studies done and a lot of the imported, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the imported porcini is not even porcini. It's like the people don't even know what it is. It's some <clears throat> mystery mushroom. And, but you went right where I wanted to go with this was, yeah, porcini and bugs. I've had that experience as well. Even in Telluride, you, you pick this porcini that you think is the most beautiful thing ever. You go about your day, you go back to eat supper, you cut it in half and it's full of bugs. And that seems to happen, you know, nine times out of 10. But as you mentioned, you got to get them early. You got to process them early and you avoid a lot of those problems. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Although I would disagree with your comment about other countries, like it might not even be a porcini. Porcini, you got to remember, is the most harvested wild mushroom on the planet. And the countries with the most experience in this are not North American. So, I mean, this is the mushroom in Italy. This is, this is the mushroom in Russia. And the whole Eastern Bloc there, like Poland, you name it. This is, it's the best mushroom for a lot of reasons. It's the iconic mushroom shape. Mm -hmm. It's the iconic mushroom flavor. Um, and there are some really dialed in outfits over there. <clears throat> They're just hard to find. We don't exclusively use, uh, Canadian porcini. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we do a blend now. BC porcini are, are milder and sweeter than European. And, and if you get into Asian porcini, like remember, um, China and all those places, they have mountains and forests too. So there's Asian porcini, there's European porcini, there's Macedonian area around the, the uh, sea there. And they have a terroir. So BC porcini or porcini off Mount Baker down in the States, just across the line there, it, because it's associated with um, spruce trees here, it gets its nutrients from the spruce trees, it's sap and stuff. So it's a, it's a more less pungent smelling, milder mushroom with more sugar content, so it's sweeter. European porcini, for the most part, like for instance in Bulgaria, it all grows under the oak trees. And oak is a big uh, tree species that it associates with a lot in, in Europe. So you have a different sap profile, a different sugar profile, and you have um, the same mushroom, but yeah, like, like grapes, it has terroir. And you'll find that, interestingly enough, we don't actually get any porcini out of China, but we have brought some in before and have seen lots of it on the market. And 
I don't actually have a problem with it. It's totally different stuff. And I'm, I'm guessing, but in my vast mushroom, dried mushroom knowledge, I think this is what happens there. So their mushroom, their porcini is very, very dark. It's very dark. Like what happened to this thing? Was it dipped in molasses or something? You have to imagine the scale of these companies over there and how big they are. And I think what happens, because what happens if I get a box of porcini mushrooms in from BC or, or uh, Italy or wherever they might come from, and I let them sit, if the moisture content is at a rate, say like above 10% moisture, which is still really dry, but just ever so slightly not dry, those mushrooms begin to darken. And they get, as the months go by, the box of mushrooms will get darker and darker. If they're bone dry, BC, North American, Porcini, they'll stay just like they are white. But if they have a bit of moisture, they'll start to darken. Now, I think in China, they'll, they have such masses coming in that if you imagine a square warehouse, this is a warehouse. So the new stuff's coming in here and it gets shifted back. And the new stuff comes in here, gets shifted back and it goes out right around the edge. And then the buyer is picking up down here. So by the time the mushrooms have done this, it could have been six, eight months to a year. It's really dark molassesy. It's like a whole different product. Hmm. And so I think that has its place. I actually really like um, an Asian powder. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like a, uh, a dried um, BC one for pretty much everything else. But that, there's a strength and umami mm -hmm. in that from that aging process. And that's not that you ask this question, but in case anybody's wondering, some mushrooms are better dried than they are fresh. Some mushrooms are way better fresh than they are dried. Porcini mushroom, if you had, if you stumbled upon a place that was serving it fresh, wonderful for you, you're going to pay some money for it. You might be impressed. You might not be. But dried, it is an incredible umami bomb, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So we're not we're not just drying the mushrooms here because they're easier to handle or something. It's some mushrooms get better when they're dried and hit hit that those taste buds. Porcini's one of them. And so yeah, it's fun playing with all those different terroirs. I would say probably Russia does the most porcini mushrooms out there just because they're the biggest country that's in that boreal forest, right? Just like we have a boreal forest here in BC and Alberta, well, that same boreal forest stretches around the globe. And so those same mushroom species grow there. Yeah. Um, and that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought both those things up is because, yeah, especially in you know Eastern Europe, the very mycophilic cultures, uh, you mentioned you're from Ukraine, your wife from Poland. I mean, this is uh, something that a lot of people there are much more familiar with, the idea of harvesting wild mushrooms, especially like the porcini. Uh, we are definitely becoming more mycophilic in Canada and North America, which is really cool. We feel like we're a part of that. You're obviously a very big part of that in what you're doing. Um, but the other thing you mentioned, and I'm glad you mentioned this too, was the, because I always thought dried mushrooms, eh, they're chewy, they're this, they're that, they're whatever. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah, porcini, for example, I got some dried porcini from um, Eugenia Bone when I was in Telluride. It was just a little little package of like dried porcini powder. Uh, interesting questions at the airport coming back. But anyways, we tried it and it was the most delicious, flavorful, umami, like something you would never get from a dry, from a fresh mushroom. And it was just a whole different experience. So that is the thing about mushrooms is sometimes these flavors need to, you know, there's, there's different ways you can enjoy them. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, there's a million analogies, but one that is on the tip of my tongue because I just did it like the day before yesterday is let's make a salsa with some fresh jalapeno peppers with from you can get them anywhere and that's going to be a wonderful salsa with your tomato and onion and lime and salt and cilantro in there and you have the salsa and it's great and then there's this other time where you're you went through the effort to go to a mexican tienda store and you bought some dried ancho chilies say hmm. and you rehydrated these dried semi-smoked chilies and you squeeze the water out of them and you dice them up and you fried them with some onions and garlic and and um, oil and and created a 
maybe you threw in a little bit of a habanero or something and you made this very different, much more complex, totally different salsa. But the two, they're, they're worlds apart. There's things you can do with dried chilies that you could never do with fresh ones. And it's the same with mushrooms. So um, a great one I like for people who already pick a bit of mushrooms is, is if, if they, you know, if they say, well, look, dude, you're trying to sell dried mushrooms. So, all right. But take the Lacinum species, for example, go pick your, Al your Alberta mushroom, the provincial mushroom of Alberta, the red top scaber stem, you know, go pick a few of those and fry them up and see how much you like them. You know, if you had a table of 10 and you served a bunch of fried, you know, blue, black, um, scaber stems too if they were polish ukrainian czech german there's going to be a few people in there that like them there's going to be a few people that say oh slimy bland whatever oh and i got the trots from it <laughs> but if you take that same mushroom and you slice it up and you dry it and then you go smell that dried mushroom it smells like this kind of complex caramel thing and you make a dish say with crumbling up some of that dried red top powder in your mushroom soup or something, you'll be floored. That mushroom, in my humble opinion, as he asked the guy who sells dried mushrooms, it should never be eaten fresh. You can get sick from it. It's slimy and gross and full of bugs half the time. But once, if you dry, slice it and dry it, the bugs run away. It becomes 10 times the thing it ever was in the first place, and you'll love it. That's, uh, you know what, that was a, that's a hot tip for me because this is obviously a mushroom that I can go harvest in Alberta, no problem. Sometimes they're everywhere. I tried it once and I didn't really like it at all. It was just like, eh, like, is this even really considered edible? It's not that great. And it's funny in Telluride, they, they do this thing where they, they harvest all these wild mushrooms and they have little signs, whether they're edible or not. So it'd be like, believe sedulous, edible, delicious gourmet, whatever, morel, edible, delicious gourmet. Then they have the, uh, the scaber stock, as you mentioned, or, or, or Lysinum, uh borealis, I think is the name. Yeah. And it says edible, uh, and then in brackets, may cause diarrhea. And it's just like, well, <laughs> maybe I don't want to eat that one, but I will try drying it because that's a whole different experience. That, it will uh, be your secret get. ingredient. Dry up Go pick a bunch of those um, red tops, dry them up, slice them thin, dry them up, turn them into a powder, put them in a little jar in your cupboard, and knock, start knocking people's socks off and just all kinds of things you cook because it's this caramelly, umami, wonderful thing. And they won't get the trots uh, unless no. there's some other part of the thing you cook. <laughs> no, no. Once that's, it's that's dried, you're, it, it is semi-toxic, that mushroom. Once it's dried that toxin is gone. Once it's dried, that sliminess is gone and um, dried and rehydrated. If you're, if you say you slice them, but you didn't powder them, when you rehydrate them, they'll still be a little bit slimy, but nowhere near to like, unless you're hardcore Polish, Ukrainian, Czech, German or something like that's you eat, sleep and breathe that kind of stuff. You're not good. Most people don't like slimy mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, Europeans love them, but most people like, it's just not no Ugh, no slimy mushrooms on toast no but drying them up that's a that's a nice tip so that's actionable for me i'm gonna go try and find one um before i i did this interview i put some questions out i said i'm gonna be interviewing eric from untamed feast he's a, a wild mushroom forager among many things um and i got some questions for you so i was just gonna hit you with a few quick questions uh we talked about a lot of this stuff but uh, we could just kind of quickly go through them. So the question, the first question is, are these farmable, which I think could be translated to, can you cultivate these mushrooms? Uh, the answer we already said is no for a lot of these, but why don't you quickly explain why? So we have a variety of mushrooms that we do a variety of things with. Our core component is wild Canadian wild, but we also have some cultivatable mushrooms that we use in places. Um, if the question is why can't they be cultivated? Um, well, you know, maybe one day they will be. And slowly things are becoming, you know, science is always advancing. But this is essentially how it works. <clears throat> you have a tree here growing in the forest. And here's the, the soil line. And down below the ground, that mycelium is connected to the tree roots. It has this relationship with a tree. 
And because when that sap flow goes down, it makes fruiting bodies that stick up, you have a mushroom. That's very hard to replicate in a lab. So these mushrooms are um, symbiotic. They have a connection, they have an arrangement, they have a contract with this forest and these trees. That's hard to, hard to do in a lab, not impossible. The best minds have been trying forever. Sometimes they make a little bit of progress. There's another type of mushroom that just thrives in eating dead decomposing matter. So if you have a cottonwood or an aspen tree or something that falls in Alberta and it's dead and starts to rot now, the spores of say the oyster mushroom will land in there. And if its conditions are just right, that's fine. That's all that mycelium needs. So it's gonna like spider webby cobweb stuff, the mycelium is gonna crawl through and start digesting this tree. It's digesting this tree, eating its cellulose, eating the sugars and stuff in the wood, rotting the tree is part of the circle of life, right? And then when it feels like it has enough nutrients from eating that rotten stuff, it makes fruiting bodies on that tree, which are, say, your oyster mushroom or many other species of, of, of mushrooms that grow like that. So think two types of mushrooms. The ones that need a living host and have an in intellectual relationship with that living host, that's very difficult to cultivate in a setting. The ones that are opportunist, let's call them scavenger mushrooms, so the non-symbiotic mushrooms, those are much easier because we can get some compost going and put the spore in that and they're going to eat that material and, and at some stage we'll figure out how to make, make them make fruit. Like, understand, even in a common button mushroom, there's a lot of science that goes into making them fruit. The mycelium is in that substrate. Let's just call it a mix of decomposed sawdust and manure and whatever it is. But they use pressure, heat, maybe compact sand. They have to do things to trick that organism into making fruit. And once that trick was discovered, whatever it was, I'm not a mushroom farmer, they could, they could do that. So that's the difference between what... Now, an interesting one, and I won't go too in-depth with this, but... We've always said that morels, you know, you'll never be able to cultivate them. But they have started cultivating the conica morel in China. And they're using, actually, it's a North American conica. It's like the one you're going to see if you pick morels in Alberta, the first little one, the conica, the brown one. <clears throat> Nobody really knows how they're doing it. But they are managing to do it. Um, and they're not having to kill massive forests in order to do it. Mm -hmm. But you got to keep in mind... And then, you know, I have friends, I've never had one actually, says so they're not bad. But let's think about wild versus cultivated. You know, deer is gamey. Beaver is gamey. Elk, if you shot it, is gamey. You know, these are intense meats. Mm -hmm. Whereas cows and stuff are mild and pigs are mild and we can all eat them. But when you want wild, you go to the grocery store and you say like, you know, I'm here to get a salmon. Oh, would you like a... Uh, farmed Atlantic salmon that we fed pellets to in a cage, or would you like a wild sockeye salmon? You know, you're going to have the wild sockeye. It just tastes better. So wild tends to concentrate a lot more flavor and in my opinion, a lot more nutrients and intelligence, if I can say that. Like it, intelligence isn't on the nutritional facts on the back of our packages, but it should be. Yeah. I'll I, leave it. I, I'll I leave it there. That. I do love that analogy, right? These are mushrooms that are out in the wild fighting for their lives, struggling. And a lot of that ends up in the final product. Uh, that's that's not a crazy assumption whatsoever. And uh, yeah, I guess you, you basically made the distinction between mycorrhizal mushrooms, which uh, just happen to be a lot of the gourmet ones like porcini, uh, morels, chanterelles versus you know, the seprobic mushrooms like oyster mushrooms, which can be cultivated, but can also be wild harvested as well. Um, so, so that's a really good, really good explanation of how that works. Next question, uh, really quick. And of course, you're not going to give up any of your spots, but this person wanted to know where to forage in Alberta. So maybe since a lot of people are going to be watching this, instead of answering where to forage in Alberta, maybe just in general, what are like some tips for someone who's never foraged for wild mushrooms before, or has never found a spot? What, what kind of things could they do to start learning uh, where to go to find some of these mushrooms? Well, that is a really easy question to answer. 
Unfortunately, coming as a BC boy born and raised, coming to Alberta seven years ago, I was shocked and dismayed to learn that most of Alberta is carved up into a lot of private land. So you need to download an app called the iHunter app. <clears throat> You're gonna pay 10 bucks a month, or maybe it's 10 bucks a year, I don't even remember what it is, but it's worth it. And it's gonna tell you on your phone, it's gonna show you all the private land and stuff. Because a lot of Alberta is private land. So for starters, you have to go to Crown land. Okay, so that means driving a couple hours north of Edmonton, getting up in the boreal forest, that's key, or driving towards the Rockies. You also can't pick in a park. So look at a map of Alberta, cut out all the private lands, cut out all the parks, just erase that. <clears throat> sure, you could go pick some mushrooms in a park as a hobbyist and probably not get busted, but it's not worth it. It's not a legal, it's not legal. And like, there's lots of crown land out there. You just got to work for it a bit. So that's, in in short, that's my best advice. And then keep in mind, it's all about the trees. You think you're hunting for mushrooms, but you're looking for trees. So learn your tree species because each type of tree is like an aisle in a grocery store. If we're going for say verpas in the spring, we need cottonwoods and, and big old growth aspen trees, black poplar. So where are those? Those are along rivers, you know, in drainages. Um, that's aisle six, okay, in a grocery store. Um, are we going for puffballs in September? Well, that's in the tamarack in Alberta, in the in the boggy tamarack. So um, that's aisle five. So are we going for high altitude porcini mushrooms up in the up in the spruce forest? Well, you know, again, that's spruce. That's aisle three. So tree species is integral. Um, and timing. Spring mushrooms are very limited, especially in Alberta. You're looking at verpas, you know, your verpa bohemica, aka poor man's morel, whatever. You got your true morel. Um, they love aspen. They love young aspen, not old aspen. They love young aspen. They love things that have burned in the past year. <clears throat> they love disturbance. Find where they're logging. Find where the find where the pipeline is going in. Um, and that includes anywhere where there's big seismic lines, pipelines, highways, anything where there's massive tree death. That's your place in the spring for morel hunting. Cut blocks, again, you can do. Cut blocks are generally where they're logging is usually crown land. You'll find some morels in cut blocks. Just because there's no tree left, because the tree is removed in logging and there's just the stump and the roots, there's very little sap to go down and feed those morels. So some morels come, but not very many because there's no big stem of sap to feed it. So fish where the fish are, I guess, is, is what you can tell people. Because, yeah, don't go looking for, uh, you know, cereal in the coffee aisle and vice versa. And the other thing you mentioned, which it was actually the next question, uh, but you brought it up anyways, was this idea of learning your trees and how important that is. Um, I think that's something that uh, a lot of people misunderstand because it seems like when you're going mushroom hunting, I guess you're looking for trees and then you're looking for mushrooms. You're not looking for the mushrooms first because you might waste a lot of time. Yeah, where you're going to be at some point, if you really get into this, or even if you get into it as a hobby, is um, it really is about the trees. So the mushrooms will be there if you're there at the right time in the right aisle. Mm -hmm. yep. It's pretty much that simple. I mean, if you're going out for Ganoderma aplanatum, a medicinal mushroom like Rishi here, um, very common all over the place but it's in aisle two which is on dead cottonwoods along big rivers that's where you're going to find the biggest ones so take your canoe and go down big rivers and look for big old dead rotten cottonwoods that are partially still standing and stuff and they're going to be there so trees are really important you're not going to go look for that mushroom in a spruce forest you'd be wasting your time you might find one but why nope that's a really good point um yeah, I feel like we've been chatting for about an hour and a half. I feel like we could chat forever. I feel like I probably should have you on for another show at some point in time because there's so much more I could ask uh, could ask you. But in the meantime, you do have a YouTube channel. I was watching a bunch of your videos where you take people out, show them some burn sites, show them. There's a pretty funny one where you're explaining uh, your your treaties on, on how to find 
uh, how to find morels uh, hidden amongst the pine cones, which I thought was really funny. Uh, you talk about Ganoderma aplanatum. You have a video about that. Lots of stuff. Uh, you got your website, Untamed Feast. Where else could people uh, connect with you if they want to learn more either about what you do or about your company or about anything like that? Well, I mean, YouTube's good. I haven't uploaded some stuff there in a while. Um, I guess life got busy. But if you want to learn about morels, go to my YouTube channel and you specifically look for a morel section or something like that. And there'll be a bunch of those videos are there. And watch those and you'll learn a lot. Um, you know, I'd love to say reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook, but um, maybe I'm getting just too old and crusty, but I'm not keen on social stuff that much anymore. Like, yes, we have a Facebook and yes, we have Instagram, but I'm not really active on those platforms too much. If if it's a, a comment on a YouTube is probably really good. Um, definitely more active in that space or um, contact us through the website. Um, is definitely get, going to get paid attention to. And I say that because understand, you know, we're a small business and everybody in the springtime and in the fall gets really excited about mushrooms. And there's only so many hours in the day to make our 16 products and whatever and answer a lot of enthusiastic people's questions pro bono. And I'm happy to do it, but I find social media can get really overwhelming for me at those times of year and I tend to kind of turn it off yeah um that doesn't mean you'll get no reply it just means that you might not be really satisfied versus reaching out on the website or um uh something like that yeah. i totally get it uh you got you got things to do because you're producing these great products so my suggestion to people watching or listening to this if you want to learn more about untamed feast go to your local grocery store and see if you can find it and if not ask the grocery store to reach out to Eric and see if you could bring it in because it is really great stuff, super high quality food, super tasty, such a good way to connect with mushrooms. Eric Whitehead, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Mushroom Show. You've been so generous with your time. Before we land this plane, is there anything else you want to let the people know? Well, as far as where to find our products, if that's the audience that we're talking to, that there's a, a place on our website that lists the stores locally in Alberta and beyond. But like a good bunch of stores, if you're going to support local here in Edmonton is, you know, your Italian stores, your, your Sunterra, your Earth General Store, Papa Watch Meats, you know, there's, there's a bunch of places. And um, if you haven't tried our stuff, I think you'll be quite impressed. It's, um, if you, if you have never used dried mushrooms before, it might just change your whole mental perspective on that. So I hope you do. That's uh, yeah, uh, I, I would second that advice. Um, I wouldn't have thought it could be so delicious, but like I said, I've been trying all this stuff and it's, it's really, really good. And it's got me more excited about culinary mushrooms than I ever have been. So thanks again for coming on. I uh, really, really appreciate it. I appreciate what you're doing for the whole uh, industry and having me on and getting people excited about this incredible food resource. So thank you for having Taking me. Part, taking part in the mushroom revolution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>